including uh, expansion of the ban on uh, foreign national contribution, uh, spending on campaign election, expanding disclosure rules related to organizational spending, and um, it requires candidates, president to, uh, and vice president to submit 10 years of uh, tax returns. Now, this bill is currently uh, held up in the Senate because number one, because of the filibuster. The Republicans have, have said that they were not gonna support this bill and Mitch McConnell has made it a, a statement that he and his uh, caucus will not support any, anything to do with this bill. So the only part, only thing, only chance this bill has of passing is passing by way of eliminating the filibuster. And, and so uh, that's gonna be up to the Democrats and right now, uh, Joe Manchin, Christian Sinema um, of Arizona, Manchin of West Virginia, they are not in favor of getting rid of, getting rid of the filibuster. So, and in a sense, it makes sense because their idea is that if, if the Republicans get in office, then they can do the same thing with any bill they want to pass. So we'll see how that goes, but right now it's, it's stalled. The second bill that I'm going to talk about is the John, Lo John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Advancement Act. Now, prior to um, this, this first act, this bill passed back in 1965, along with the Voting Rights Act. In, in essence, it gutted the, the primary uh, emphasis on this bill, and that is to make sure that before states change their voting rights and voting procedures, particularly those who had a history of discrimination, that they would go and uh, get clearance from the federal government to, uh, to enact these changes. So, uh, so this, this bill provided tools to address discrimination practice and to seek protection for all Americans' uh, right to vote. It created a new formula for coverage that applies to all states and hinges on finding of repeated voter rights violations. So anyway, the Supreme Court uh, gutted that and in, in stating, in so doing, it stated that again, as I said, it was, uh, it was too broad and discriminatory. Fortunately, the Supreme Court decision was limited to in scope and recommended that Congress create a new formula and the John R. Lewis advancement does just that. It's an attempt to rectify the decision that the Supreme Court made gutting this bill. And right now, as you can see across the country, as a result of not having this protection, uh, states are enacting all kinds of voter restriction laws to uh, prevent minorities from voting, particularly after the 2020 law. So right now, these bills are stalled in Congress, and um, Mitch McConnell, they, matter of fact, they tried to have a vote back in October, I think it was like November 6th, November 3rd, and the uh, Republicans would not even allow them to uh, bring this bill up for, for a vote. So anyway, that's where we are on those bills. They are stalled, and they're working now to try to work through, through those bills. Uh, also, the, the, the fear is that on the Republican side, according to Ms. McConnell, the bill gives too much uh, authority to the federal government to control the elections at the state level. And so, but the real reason is that they fear that after the 2020 election that all of these people are going to vote and they're not going to get back in power. And also they want to stall Joe Biden's agenda so that come 2022, they will have set up the situation so that Republicans have a better chance of taking back the House and the Senate. So that, that's basically, in a nutshell, what those two bills are. Now I'll move on to the infrastructure bill. The original infrastructure bill, uh, there were two parts of it. One had to do with the actual infrastructure, and the other had to do with what they call, uh, I call it the social agenda. And in the original bill, um, the objection to the bill were, were, and this is Manchin and Cinnamon, that the bill was too high, uh, 
Manchin did not like the climate related part of the bill that provided cash incentives to the for clean energy, uh, electric cars, and uh, which had negatively affected the coal industry, which he has business with. Uh, Cinema objected to the expansion of Medicare to include dental, vision, hearing, AIDS, Medicare, uh, medical nego uh, negotiation for drugs, Medicare negotiation for drugs, 12 week family leave, and also Manchin op opposed the child tax credit without work, without a work provision. So right now, this bill is, is also in the um, in the uh, the house. So what did pass was the infrastructure, the actual infrastructure bill. And this bill on November 6th, the infrastructure bill was passed and sent to the president for his signature. And <clears throat> so this bill contains uh, the following. It was $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill. And uh, it contains, and I'll just run through this rather quickly. There was $110 billion for highway bridges and roads, $39 billion for public transport, Transit, it's 66 billion for rail service improvement, 7.5 billion for electric vehicles, charging stations, and converting school buses to electric and hybrids, 65 billion to modify modernize the electric grid, 520, I mean, excuse me, 25 billion to make improvements to airports, gates, taxiways, and terminals, 55 billion with, uh, for wastewater and water treatment, including 15 billion to replace lead pipes, 10 billion to address water contamination, 6.5 billion for, uh, for broadband improvements to improve service to rural areas, low-income families, and tribal communities. So the bill is to be paid for by tapping into uh, $200 billion, $210 billion unspent COVID-19 fund, $53 billion in unused unemployment fund and various other available funds. Now, um, so that is the uh, that is the infrastructure bill. Now getting back to the, uh, what I call the bill back that a social bill. Again, as I said, this bill, originally these two bills were designed at least from the house side to pass together. And there were a lot of uh, discussion and resistance from the progressive Democrats in the House to passage of this fair infrastructure bill because they wanted the social or the part build back better social aspect of this bill to pass also. Mm. But negotiation came down to okay, we got to pass something. So what we'll do is we'll pass the infrastructure bill, pure infrastructure bill. Then what we will do is we'll come back to and look at the, uh, what I call the social aspect of this bill. And uh, I was listening to uh, Representative Jai Paul talk on Rachel Maddow the other night, and she feels very certain that they have a, a commitment to pass this bill sometime uh, next week. And the, 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 the thing that's holding it up from the uh, centrist Democrats' point of view is the cost of the bill. So they're waiting now for this, the budget office to score this bill and to make sure that the bill coincides with, uh, and cost-wise coincide with the uh, the price that the Biden administration has outlined. So once that is determined, the bill will pass, go through the Senate, and be sent back to the House. I sent, excuse me, go through the House and be sent back to the Senate. Now in the Senate, the problem there is going to be whether or not they can get this bill passed through reconciliation. Now, my understanding of this is that, that any bill that deals with money, they can deal with, they can pass it on the basis of reconciliation. So this, this is where those bills stand right now. So um, that's, now the other thing about these bills, the mansion and uh, they objected to raising taxes on the rich. So we'll see how that, uh, how that how that plays out, but basically that's the status of these bills, and that's my presentation in a, in a nutshell. Screen here. All right. All right. We wanted to make sure that we uh, we played that again because it was a an important discussion uh, that was held last month. 
uh, and hopefully everybody uh, has a chance to see that. So, all right, now we're going to get a little bit closer to our main presentation here. Um, so the Healthier Black Elders Center um, started in 1997 and is funded by the uh, National Institutes of Health. The center aims to address and reduce health disparities through research and education. We do this through our research registry, where individuals learn um, about various social and behavioral research studies and may be invited to participate. Currently, we have over 1,200 active uh, older Black adults in our registries. We also host various events, like today, that provide health-related education to the community with a focus on aging. We provide education on topics that range from diabetes to heart health to food safety, nutrition, creating healthy habits, and brain health. Uh, typically, we hold these events in person, and you know, in the meantime, we hope you're still able to enjoy this virtual uh, format with us. You know, knock on wood, we're going to look to trying to get back in person in 2022, but you know, we'll see. To learn about uh, our program, please visit our website, www.micoar.org. That's www.mcuaaar.org. Or call our office at area code 313-664-2616. For anyone that is not currently an HBC member and would like to join, please call the office to complete a survey and get added to our mailing list. You will then start to receive our biannual newsletter that lists program events, recruiting studies, and more health information. I will say that website and phone number again for everybody. The website is www.micwar.org. That's M-C-U-A-A-A-R.org. And the phone number is area code 313-664-2616. All right. Uh, before we uh, get going with the presentations, we're just going to make a couple uh, housekeeping announcements here. Uh, this presentation is in webinar format. So that means attendees, your cameras are going to be off. You'll be muted. We're not going to see you and we're not going to hear you. Uh, for those that are joining it uh, by computer, if you have a question for any of the speakers, please submit your questions in the Q&A box at any time. Uh, the Q&A button can be found at the bottom of your Zoom window. For those joining by telephone, if you have a question that does not get answered by the end of our program, please call the HBEC office and leave a message with your question. Uh, one of our staff will follow up with you. All right. Uh, and with regards to recording, yes, this, uh, this event is being recorded right now. It'll be available in the future on our, uh, our various McGuire websites. And it's also being streamed on Facebook Live uh, for, for individuals to be able to watch. All right, so now we're going to move on to our main presentation. Um, I'd like to introduce a couple of, of my colleagues from uh, Michigan State University Extension here. Uh, Georgina Perry is a social worker and has an MA in Family and Consumer Sciences. She works for Michigan State University Extension as a health educator with a focus on social emotional health and well being across the lifespan. So she teaches research based education to the community in areas of anger management stress management using mindfulness, healthy relationships, caregiving, chronic pain, uh, pain management, falls prevention, and substance uh, abuse issues. Uh, my other colleague, Liz Williams, uh, is an extension health educator housed in Genesee County, and she specializes in disease prevention and community be behavioral health programming. Uh, before her work as a health educator, she worked as a community nutrition instructor uh, for MSU Extension, delivering SNAP-Ed nutrition education uh, in and throughout Genesee County. Uh, Liz received her master's in community health education from Wayne State University and earned her bachelor in fam uh, family studies with a concentration on substance abuse education, prevention, intervention, and treatment from Central Michigan University. Uh, so Georgina and Liz, uh, you can go ahead and share your screen and let's, let's, uh, let's talk about the opioid crisis. Hi, thank you, Sean, for having us join your group today. And um, we'll be presenting to you on recognizing, preventing, and treatment of opioid misuse. And this comes from the Michigan Substance Use Prevention Education and Recovery, which is a my super team. And I'd like to go over our affirmative action statement. 
MSU is an affirmative action equal opportunity employer. Michigan State University extension programs and materials are open to all without regard to race, color, national origin, sex, gender, gender identity, religion, age, height, weight, disability, political beliefs, sexual orientation, marital, family, or veteran status. So our programs are open and available to all. So my super is a two year project funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. It brings together experts and educators in collaborative work from MSU Extension, MSU College of Human Medicine and the Health Department of Northwest Michigan. The overall goal of the My Super project is to increase awareness of opioid misuse in rural communities. During this past year of the pandemic, Michigan overdose death rates due to opioids have continued to increase. Emergency medical services, as well as emergency departments in Michigan, both saw substantial increases in opioid overdoses since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. These increases are a tragic reminder of the continued toll of the opioid epidemic and why education and prevention work is necessary. So just to give you an overview of today's presentation, we're gonna talk about what are opioids as well as what is opioid misuse, look at the effects that opioids has on the body, how the crisis has impacted Michigan, treatment and recovery options, and then what we can do in this effort. Also, we do understand that opioid content as well as imagery may be potentially triggering or could even induce feelings of distress. So we do ask that you please take care of yourselves throughout the presentation. So to begin, we want to take the opportunity to offer some foundational information in which we're gonna to continue to build on throughout the presentation. We start by looking at what are opioids. Opioids are drugs that block pain signals in the body and increase dopamine release. Usually they are used to treat moderate to severe pain. Opioids bind to receptors in the brain that signal for the release of dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter that provides energy, motivation, and also makes us feel good. Some opioids are legal when they are prescribed to you by a medical provider. Others, such as heroin, are illegal. Opioids can cause overstimulation and damage to normal brain function. So just what is opioid misuse? It is when you take an opioid medication prescribed by your doctor, but you take it in higher quantities or perhaps frequencies than indicated, or when you take it for a longer period of time. Also taking an opioid medication prescribed by someone else's doctor, or if you use the opioid to obtain a high feeling, and opioid misuse can begin accidentally with the safe use of painkillers. So it's important to understand that opioid use disorder is a brain disease. Opioids can cause massive overstimulation and disruption as well as damage to normal brain function. As I mentioned earlier, Opioids stimulate receptors for the release of dopamine, which is a natural neurotransmitter that provides energy, motivation, and also makes us feel good. So here's an example to help illustrate the changes that are happening within the brain. A normal dopamine level for a person on any given day is approximately 40 to 50 nanograms. On the best day of your life, whether it's a wedding day, a graduation, or perhaps birth of a child, that level may be up to 100 nanograms. 
And for someone who is using heroin, their level may be as high as 950 nanograms. It may take up to two years to heal as well as restore that normal functioning in the brain. Also, when we consider the old view of addiction, it was stigmatized as a character flaw and even a moral failing. Addiction was viewed as an acute condition, whereas now it is viewed as a chronic illness. And previously, abstinence was viewed as the only approach to recovery instead of efforts to minimizing use or reduce harm. Also, relapse was viewed as a weakness, and now it is considered a part of the long-term recovery process. We can help to reduce stigma around opioid use disorder by paying attention to how we view and talk about addiction. So we're gonna look at the different effects that opioids has on our bodies. Beginning with the brain, there are physiological changes in the brain in response to opioid misuse. Addiction is a disease that comes from these changes rather than from a lack of willpower. Opiate painkillers can cause daytime sedation and sleepiness, and chronic painkiller use is associated with a higher risk of major depression. Looking at the effects that opiates has on our respiratory system, it can cause respiratory depression, which is a slowing of our breathing and can result in death. The effects of opiates on our nervous system, hyperalgesia, which is an increased sensitivity to pain, potentially caused by nerve damage. Opioid-induced hyperalgesia can cause greater pain and sensitization and opioids can cause psychomotor impairment, which is a slowing of our physical movements. And the effects that opioids have on our digestive system. Opioid-induced slow digestion can lead to constipation, and opioid painkiller abuse can lead to nausea and vomiting. and the effects that they have on our liver. Liver damage can occur due to acetaminophen and prescription painkillers, such as Vicodin or Percocet, and acetaminophen is known as Tylenol. So one way to reduce stigma is to use appropriate language when we're talking about persons that are in recovery. We challenge you to change the words that you use as we talk about this community issue. So for example, some terms not to use would be addict, abuser, or junkie. Instead, you would say person with a substance use disorder. Rather than referring to someone as alcoholic or drunk, the correct terminology is person with an alcohol use disorder and instead of referring to an oxy addict or a meth head, you would say person with an opioid use disorder. Rather than saying ex addict or former alcoholic, you would refer to them as a person that is in recovery. And when you are talking about drug test, instead of saying clean or dirty, you would say negative or positive results. And instead of saying addictions or addictive disorders, the correct terminology is to say addiction or substance use disorder. So the opioid epidemic by numbers, and this is information from 2019, there were 11.4 million people that misused prescription opioids and it is estimated that over 130 people died every day from opioid-related 
drug overdoses. We can go to the next slide. So looking specifically at Michigan um, data, in 2019, there were 2,354 drug overdose deaths. 2019 opioid related overdose deaths, there were 1,768. And most recently, according to initial data from Michigan's Department of Health and Human Services, when you're looking at January through June of 2020, as the COVID-19 pandemic occurred, there was a 20% increase in opioid-related overdose deaths compared to that same period in 2019. Due to some missing data during the pandemic, it is estimated that the 2020 overdose deaths may be underreported. So let's look at what are some of the effects of this crisis. The opioid epidemic impacts individuals, families, and communities at large. Some of the effects of the opioid crisis on children specifically are what's referred to as the neonatal abstinence syndrome or the neonatal withdrawal syndrome. This is a group of problems that occurs in a newborn who has been exposed to opioid drugs for a length of time while in their mother's womb. Babies can then go through drug withdrawal after birth. This syndrome most often applies to opioid medicines. More US children have been placed in foster care than in previous years due to parental drug misuse. In just one year, between 2016 and 2017, Michigan experienced an 8% increase in children entering the foster care system for this particular reason. There's also the generational impact, meaning a child that experiences a parent's or caregiver's substance misuse will be at a greater risk of substance misuse themselves as an adult. As we know, ACEs, which is the adverse childhood experiences, are not deterministic. Awareness and education can help mitigate the likelihood of continuing a cycle of risky health behaviors, such as alcohol and drug use. This is something that we'll discuss a little further on in the presentation. So who is at risk for opioid misuse dependency and substance abuse disorder? Anyone is. People that are prescribed opioid medication for a variety of conditions that become chronic can turn into a dependence. <clears throat> we have a, a very brief video to show you. And this is Anne Marie's story. My son, Christopher Parado, was 20 years old when he was prescribed opioids. It took him five days to get addicted. I'm not supposed to be the one to go get his suit and tie and pick which sneakers that I'm going to bury him in. My son overdosed at the age of 22 years old. And I'm going to pass it over now to um, my coworker, Liz. Thanks, Georgina. So as <clears throat> Georgina just mentioned, um, anyone really is at risk for uh, opioid misuse. And there are some specific risk factors that um, may put you more at risk, though. So risk factors are characteristics that are biological, psychological, family, community, or cultural level that proceed and are associated with a higher likelihood of negative outcomes. Risk factors can increase a person's likelihood for substance use disorder. 
Some risk factors for substance use disorder are home and social environment, history of trauma, abuse, or ACEs, availability and access and tolerance of a substance, other mental health issues, genetic predisposition, uh, and sensitivity to the substance. Protective factors are skills, strengths, and resources, supports or coping strategies in individuals and families that help mitigate the risk factors. These are the exact opposite of risk factors. Some of those include social support, healthy and positive childhood environment and experiences, good mental, physical, spiritual, and emotional health, and no genetic predisposition. So you may be wondering why people misuse opioids. Uh, as you can see here from SAMHSA's 2017 data that there are a variety of reasons why people misuse opioids. Um, some of the main reasons uh, are 62.3% uh, to relieve physical pain, 10.8% uh, to relax or relieve tension, and 12.9% to feel good or get high. Uh, this chart and data looks at people ages 12, 12 years and older, and for a majority of those misusing, uh, over half are seeking to actually relieve that physical pain. And then just 11, like I mentioned, are attempting to relax or relieve tension. And again, only 12% of those are seeking to feel good or experience a high. So if someone is taking a prescription opioid to address a chronic pain issue, their use may transi transition to misuse or an opioid use disorder. Um, some might know that as dependence as described earlier. So how would you know if someone is misusing an opioid? Some signs that occur with misuse include constricted pupils, runny nose or nose sores, sweaty and clammy skin, moving slower than usual, slurred speech, unable to move in a coordinated way, lack of awareness or and attention to people and things around them, being sedated and acting drowsy, needle marks on the skin if they are injecting the drug. There may also be other potential signs that are not physical, such as a person experiencing new financial difficulties and stealing from friends or family. They may socially isolate themselves as well. Those or these signs are something you or others may notice. Just like you might have observed someone with a cold having a cough or runny nose or even sniffling. On the other hand, those signs could also point to other condi conditions such as something like allergies. So it's important to take many of these signs into consideration as someone who may be misusing opioids or experiencing an opioid use disorder may not demonstrate signs at <clears throat> all at once or right away. For a person who is misusing opioids, uh, they may experience different symptoms such as uh, a person that has a cold, having a cold fever, body aches, sore throat, uh, et cetera, feeling unusually happy, excited, or high, problems with attention or memory, feeling sad or losing interest in activities one normally enjoys, less sensitive to pain, feeling hopeless, confusion, or constipation. Because misusing opioids can lead to serious consequences, such as an experiencing an overdose or even death, we need to consider not not only why people are misusing opioids, but how people are accessing uh, those opioids as well. So for those um, looking at the screen, uh, this chart from SAMHSA shows that majority of people 
um, that large gray section are either given opioids, took them or bought them from friends or family. Uh, that is about a little bit over half the pie chart for those on the phone. Of majority of that, 38.6 receive them from for free from a friend or family. Um, about 37.6% of people actually access opioids from a legitimate legal physician prescription. In light of this, it's important to keep medication safe and secure so family and friends aren't able to access them. It's also important for those of us working in prevention spaces to inform our communities about safe medication practices such as keeping them in a locked medicine cabinet or a medication lockbox, and collaborate with healthcare providers on best practices to prevent misuse from a clinical standpoint. So if you or someone you know is considering the use of opioids for pain, man pain management, know that preventing misuse begins with having that intentional conversation with your provider. By asking good questions and seeking information, you can help yourself and other loved ones understand the risks and potential consequences involved. Protect yourself, loved ones, and others by talking about your questions and concerns regarding opioid medications with a medical provider. If you or someone you know is considering the use of opioids to manage a health condition, it is important to be informed of the potential risks and benefits and to work with your healthcare provider to make sure you are getting the safest and most effective care. Ask your doctor about non-opioid options for pain relief. Let your doctor know about any other medications you take. That does include um, any of the over-the-counter medications as well. And an intentional conversation with your doctor can help prevent misuse, addiction, and overdose. There are also a variety of non-pharmaceutical and alternative approaches to pain management. Some people may even try a combination of strategies to address their personal preferences and needs. <clears throat> Alternative options include acupuncture, which is the use of thin needles to stimulate particular points of the body to mitigate pain, chiropractic care, uh, which is the use of manual therapy, including spinal manipulation that supports the body's ability to heal itself and improve joint function and motion. This incorporates techniques such as stretching, the use of pressure, and joint manipulations. Spinal manipulation uh, is a complementary health approach typically offered by a licensed professional, such as a chiropractor or physical therapist. And this is the use of controlled joint movements or thrusts to the spinal joint. Massage therapy, which is the use of massaging techniques to manipulate the body's soft tissue to manage a health condition or pain. And then Tai Chi and Qi Gong, which are centuries old mind and body practices. They involve gentle movements with intentional mental focus and breathing and relaxation uh, techniques for improved balance and strength. Uh, MSU Extension offers many prevention-oriented programs such as Stress Less with Mindfulness, Relax, Tai Chi, and Chronic Pain Path. Many of uh, MSU Extension's uh, programs are being offered online and in person as of a couple months ago, and most of them are free and available to the public. They are helpful as prevention and recovery tools. And like I mentioned, many of them are offered um, over Zoom to meet you where you are. Uh, community partners can refer patients, clients, um, and anyone to these programs. There are many uh, other MSU Extension remote learning resources available on our remote learning website. Um, that is www c a n r dot m s u dot e d u backslash r l r backslash and we'll make sure to share that um, again with you all 
If anyone is interested in learning more about specific programs, um, you can follow up during the Q&A time and we can share specific website links. Um, and at this time, if anyone um, has ever tried any of these alternatives to managing some of those <clears throat> um, alternative options to managing pain, we would love to hear, please share in the chat. Did I? And then I am going to go over um, some of MSU extensions programs uh, briefly that are currently being offered. So I'm a uh, chronic pain path is a six week self management workshop to help people use tools to manage their chronic pain. Farm stress, um, we have a lot of on online resources uh, available to support those in farming and agribiz, including a teletherapy referral program. We offer uh, mental health first aid training that helps equip participants to know how to intervene when someone is experiencing mental health distress. So it's similar to first aid, um, just helping uh, individuals better understand what to do in those types of situations. Uh, relax alternative to anger is uh, managing and anger and stress and develop the communication and problem solving skills needed for healthy relationships. Stress less with mindfulness, uh, that introduces mindfulness concepts and practices to reduce stress and related symptoms. And then again, Tai Chi, um, that, that is a very old practice that introduces Tai Chi forms and supports both <clears throat> mental and physical well-being. There are a variety of treatment programs and resources available. Uh, and today we'll be highlighting three primary areas of evidence-based practice. Know there are many factors involved in someone's treatment and their success in recovery. Because opioid use disorder is a chronic health condition, it's important to connect people to care. Uh, the three areas uh, that we will be talking about are recovery-oriented systems of care, medications for opioid use disorder, and uh, therapy or counseling with attention to ACEs. Uh, ROSC, or Re Recovery Oriented Systems of Care, offer a network of community-based services and supports that builds on strengths and resiliencies of individuals, families, and communities to achieve improved health and wellness and quality of life. A uh, key to recovery oriented systems of care um, is the involvement of patients, their families, and their community to continually improve access to and the quality of services. It includes, but is not limited to post treatment support like continuing care, ongoing recovery support groups, um, relapse prevention programs, employment support. Uh, recovery coaches, ongoing checkups, and then just some self-monitoring support. The next one is medications for opioid use disorder or medication for addiction treatment, sometimes referred to as MAT. Uh, this is the use of FDA approved medications alone or with a combination of counseling and behavioral therapies, providing a whole a patient approach to treating substance use disorders. MOUD programs provide a safe and controlled level of medication for treatment of opioid use disorder. Each of these medications work differently and are prescribed and monitored as treatment by a provider. A common misconception associated with MOUD is that it substitutes one drug for another. Instead, MOUD uh, medications relieve the withdrawal symptoms and the psychological cravings that cause chemical imbalances in the body. MOUD, MOUD decreases opioid use and opioid-related overdose deaths. And then finally, uh, behavioral therapy or counseling also play a major role in a person's recovery journey. In particular, therapy addressing adverse childhood experiences or ACEs is important. 
Behavioral health services can help address ACEs, which are adverse or traumatic uh, childhood experiences. Uh, for example, living in a household with substance misuse or experiencing uh, or witnessing violence, abuse, or neglect in the household. These events are tied to adulthood, adulthood chronic health problems, including obesity, heart disease, diabetes, substance misuse, or mental health illness. While ACEs have a significant influence on someone's well-being, they are not deterministic and poor health, health outcomes are not inevitable. Behavioral health specialists can help a person in recovery develop uh, resilience and mitigate some of the, the impacts of ACEs. It's also important to seek out or provide culturally sensitive and appropriate behavioral health studies or services. <clears throat> uh, recovery. Every, everyone has a different nonlinear path through recovery, and this, this can include seeking and receiving various levels of care, um, some that we just talked about, having relapses and multiple attempts um, are often very common in recovery. Similar to someone living with diabetes may struggle with healthy eating, consistently exercising and monitoring their blood glucose, someone in recovery may also experience several recovery attempts and setbacks as a typical part of the recovery process. What's, it, what's important is that the person in recovery develops and maintains strong relationships and support networks. This helps them develop uh, resilience to manage those setbacks. Engaging peer recovery coaches is very beneficial. Uh, these coaches are peers who provide hope and support and accountability for those in recovery, since they've also experienced recovery, their own recovery journey. Uh, check with your local substance use disorder treatment agencies on the availability and contact information for recovery coaches. Um, we're seeing a lot more recovery coaches in this space now and even seeing them in um, emergency departments, which is very, very helpful um, to individuals. Community and nonprofit organizations and healthcare systems may, many of um, you in which the audience may represent, provide additional trainings and supports. Uh, there is, like I said, a lot of virtual programming um, in the recovery space, um, they actually really love the virtual option now um, because it allows them to get together more often and hold those recovery support meetings. There are a lot of uh, hotlines and national numbers that are available that provide 24 seven free confidential support for people that are in distress. One is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and that number is 1-800-272 8255. Um, and again, just checking with your local community mental health agencies, health departments, healthcare systems. Uh, they typically have local um, support and resources available. And then again, there are those national um, <clears throat> resources available as well. When participating in recovery uh, yourself or supporting someone you know, developing a toolbox of strategies to ma manage chronic pain and other conditions is critical. Some strategies include um, maintaining a good sleep hygiene schedule. So <clears throat> some of the examples of that is waking up and going to sleep at the same time each day, avoiding caffeine and too much eating or drinking before sleeping. And if someone in recovery is experiencing sleep challenge, um, talk to a healthcare provider um, before trying to uh, determine what's going on yourself. Some other tips are developing and maintaining uh, healthy eating habits to ensure good nutrition, participate in individual and group therapy and counseling sessions, learn problem solving and coping skills, participate in meaningful and purposeful activities such as volunteering, Find a creative outlet, outlet or hobby such as music, journaling, art, um, physical activity and exercising such as yoga and Tai Chi. Uh, that I hear is a very, very, very uh, good outlet for many people in recovery uh, is incorporating some type of 
physical activity routine, uh, relaxation techniques, and jo uh, joining a support group. And for those of you who know an individual or people in recovery, coming alongside of them and doing these activities or uh, other things together can be extremely meaningful to that person in recovery. Uh, helping individuals develop those support networks is critical to sustain long-term recovery efforts. Family and friends can walk alongside loved ones through treatment and potential uh, relapses. It's important to recognize that recovery may take months or even years. So maintaining a positive attitude about recovery is very important. You can help a loved one develop coping, seeking, uh, coping skills and seek out or maintain that treatment. Uh, family members are also impacted by opioid use and substance use disorder, and they can look for treatment and recovery programs offering support and resources. Uh, they're av available for family members, children, um, friends. There are many different local resources available. So again, just contacting your local substance use disorder organizations to see what's available in your community. Uh, attending family and or marriage counseling, uh, education and counseling sessions, seek education about uh, substance misuse, addiction and recovery. I think it uh, is very important to have that foundational information about uh, substance misuse um, to better understand your family and recovery. Uh, be willing to address any conflicts, emotional barriers, or resentments that might interfere or interrupt someone's recovery efforts. This helps create a uh, conducive environment for long-term recovery. And then lastly, uh, participate in any of those alumni activities such as workshops, family weekends. Um, these just help support that person in recovery. I know uh, many organizations hold specific events that are sober events like sober dances or sober kickball um, just to get um, individuals in recovery in an environment that they're surrounded with like-minded uh, individuals. So attending those uh, events with them would be helpful. And I am going to turn it back over to Georgina to wrap it up. All right, thanks Liz. So these are some things that we can all do about the crisis in our community. Join a local, local substance misuse prevention coalition, offer educational prevention programs, um, connecting with a faith-based faith prevention community, making naloxone available in case of overdose. Um, and naloxone is a medication that is designed to rapidly reverse opioid overdose. It is an opioid antagonist, meaning that it binds to opioid receptors and can reverse as well as block the effects of other opioids. You could also receive some naloxone training um, so that you know how to apply and with the usage of naloxone. Work with healthcare systems such as pharmacies, nonprofits, law enforcement, and others and then remove barriers to treatments that may be um, found in the community. So if you would like to, we'd like, we want to know um, what you have already done or what are some things that you think you would like to do in order to address opioid misuse in your community. Um, and feel free to type that into the chat box. If you'd like to share that with us. And then this is a brief um, video that um, shows the use of naloxone. It's important to be able to recognize the signs of an overdose. Signs of an opioid overdose include not waking up or responding to your voice or touch, breathing that is very slow, irregular, or has even stopped. The dark center part of the eyes becomes very small, sometimes called pinpoint pupils. Fingernails and lips turn blue or purple, a slow heartbeat, weak pulse, or low blood pressure. If someone has these signs, here's how you can help. Narcan nasal spray is a medicine that reverses the effects of an opioid overdose. 
Narcan nasal spray is not a substitute for emergency medical care. Repeated doses may be necessary. As with any drug, you need to be aware of important safety information about its use. Please pay particular attention to the indications and important safety information at the end of this video. Also, please see the accompanying full prescribing information in the use of this product. Narcan nasal spray was designed for use wherever an emergency opioid overdose happens. Because it doesn't require specialized medical training, it can be given to someone by following these instructions. First, lay the person on their back. Then, remove the device from the box and peel back the package. Hold the device with your thumb on the bottom of the plunger and two fingers on either side of the nozzle. Tilt the person's head back and provide support under their neck with your hand. Place and hold the tip of the nozzle in one nostril until your fingers touch the bottom of their nose. Press the plunger firmly to give the dose into the person's nose. After giving the dose, remove the device from the person's nostril and move them on their side, positioning their hands under their head. Call 911 and get emergency medical help right away after giving the first dose of Narcan nasal spray, even if the person wakes up. Narcan is not a substitute for emergency medical care. Keep the person under observation. If the person doesn't respond by waking up to voice or touch or breathing normally after two to three minutes, administer the second dose provided in the box in the alternate nostril. If they respond and the signs of an opioid emergency have returned after Narcan nasal spray is given, then give another dose in the alternate nostril using a new device and watch them closely until emergency help is received. Additional doses may be given every two to three minutes until they respond or emergency medical help is received. It's important. All right, so there are many ways that you can access naloxone, including through pharmacies, um, another option is to have it mailed to you. So the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services has partnered with Next Naloxone. This is a service that provides naloxone to individuals that are not able to pick it up themselves from a specific site. The partners will provide free naloxone to individuals via mail. And to qualify for this mail-based naloxone distribution, You'll need to view a training video and answer a short quiz and provide enrollment information. And finally, we can keep in mind Michigan's Good Samaritan Law, which prevents drug possession charges against those that seek medical assistance for an overdose in certain circumstances. This law makes saving lives the priority during a drug overdose and not criminal prosecutions of illegal drug users. Using naloxone can help save lives. So what can we do about opioid misuse? Storing your medications safely by locking them up, not sharing your prescription medications with others, Taking any unused medications that you have to prescription drop, drop off points. Also learning to recognize those signs and symptoms of opioid misuse. Educating others about addiction, that it is a chronic disease and being ambassadors to help reduce stigma. Remembering that addiction is not a lack of willpower and um, utilizing syringe exchange programs that may be available in your community. So I'd like to thank you um, for allowing us to join you today. And if you do have any questions for us, you can feel free to type those into the chat box. Sure, we've got uh, one question to start here. So uh, the opioid crisis is, is very important for senior populations for a very, very common reason. More seniors have these prescriptions, right? You know, uh, yes. there's more likely that you're gonna, gonna receive a prescription for some sort of, of condition or for some level of pain management. Uh, so getting into uh, to locking up and, and keeping safe these medications, uh, are there any particular uh, are there any particular lock boxes or, or any items that would be more helpful than just say trying to lock it up in a, uh, you know, in, in a desk in a 
you know, in a, in a study somewhere, what, what would be the best way to make sure that uh, people who shouldn't have their hands on it, keep their hands off it? I would say the best thing to do is talk to your pharmacist. They can show you what types of lock boxes they might have there, or they can refer you to um, where you might be able to order some online, okay. but yes, they definitely do have some, um, lock boxes that are, are very ideal and they are um, typically they're user friendly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so an, another question, uh, upon use of, of an opioid, how long does it take for the body to become dependent on the opioid? I know the video said within five days, uh, is that is that consistent? Um, I would say, I mean, it's going to uh, change based um, slightly from individual, but yeah, it is not uncommon for someone in just that short amount of a time, in this instance being five days, for the body to, to become um, addicted to that particular substance. Okay, very good, very good. Um, and, and I think another thing that I, I also want to highlight as we start to transition towards the end of uh, our, our discussion here is yeah, this, this, this can affect uh, individuals of all age. So even if, you know, some of our older population may not be abusing these medications, there are family members and loved ones and friends to, you know, to make sure that you keep an eye out for, keep an eye out for the signs and symptoms that were, that were brought up in this discussion, because you never know when a presentation like this may lead you into possibly being able to help save somebody's life. Um, uh, and I, I think that's that's of the utmost importance to remember. So, uh, so Georgina yeah. or Liz, if you if you don't have anything else to to add, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Uh, this is a a wonderful presentation, and you know it's really useful, really useful to uh, to hopefully our our whole audience and everybody who's going to be able to uh, uh, to catch our recordings in the future. So, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate that. Uh, and for those of you on the call, today's presentation has been live streamed and recorded. Honestly, you'll be able to, to see it again in the future. Uh, we upload all the Lunch and Learn recordings to our website. Uh, and again, if uh, anybody is not a member of HBE yet and is interested in, in joining, we can sign you up over the phone. Please give us a call at 313-664-2616. And when you become an HBEC member, you'll receive our biannual newsletter, learn more about research studies, uh, and more about our future programs like this one today. Uh, so again, for those who've logged on through Zoom uh, via their computers or phones or other devices, um, a survey is going to open up uh, after the webinar ends. So don't be surprised by that. Uh, we'll have a window coming up. That way we can get, uh, if you can spare a minute or two, we can get some feedback uh, to that allow us to help plan our 2022 events. So again, for on behalf of Georgina, Liz, and all the HB team, thank you so much to everybody for, uh, for coming today. Uh, and keep an eye out in your mailboxes for information about our 2022 Lunch and Learn series. All right. Thank you much. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Bye. -bye.